Cooper, and do they have any concerns about living their lives in the permanent public space? Plus, we're going to be debating whether the Germans got it right this week to relax the rules on cannabis. But first, an update on the latest news headlines. Good evening, the top stories. Thousands of Israelis are gathering in Jerusalem, calling for the release of hostages still being held by the Hamas terror group. It comes as today marks six months since the terror attack on the 7th of October. Marking the occasion, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has said the government continues to stand by Israel's right to defend its security. And he added the UK is shocked by the bloodshed and called for an immediate humanitarian pause in fighting. He also urged Hamas to release its hostages and implored Israel to get aid into Gaza more swiftly. Meanwhile, the Foreign Secretary has used the occasion to stress that the UK's support for Israel is not unconditional. Writing in the Sunday Times, Lord Cameron said there's no doubt where the blame lies over the death of three British aid workers, and he added this must never happen again. John Chapman, James Henderson and James Kirby died in airstrikes carried out by the IDF on an aid convoy on the 1st of April. The Deputy Prime Minister has denied claims that the UK is failing to prepare for war. Oliver Dowden is defending the government after outgoing Armed Forces Minister James Heapy told The Telegraph only Ministry of Defence officials attended a wartime preparation exercise which was meant for the whole of government. Former Defence Secretary Ben Wallace has backed him up, saying too many in government are just hoping everything goes away. Police have named a man they're searching for after a woman was stabbed to death in broad daylight in Bradford City Centre. West Yorkshire police detectives say they want to trace 25-year-old Habiba Masoom, who's from the Oldham area. They were called to the city centre yesterday afternoon following reports of an attack by a man who then fled the scene. The woman was taken to hospital where she died. And a British man nicknamed Hardest Geezer has become the first person to run the length of Africa. Russell Cook from Worthing in West Sussex crossed the finish line in Tunisia today. He ran through 16 countries in 352 days. The 27-year-old said he'd struggled with his mental health, gambling and drinking, and he said he'd wanted to make a difference. He's raised over £600,000 for charity. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. So, am I the only person who feels that privacy is fast becoming resigned to history? Thanks to social media, not all of which is bad, by the way, we can now transmit or receive the minutiae of life's most banal, some would say private moments. Whether at home, on a beach, single or married, joyful or depressed, we can tell everyone about it at the touch of a button. For some, this is literally their job, and that's fine. That's within their control. But there are also rapidly emerging ways in which surveillance is not optional. We've had zero say in whether we consent to this minute by minutes intrusion and this week the march towards bi di biometric digital id that is mandatory surveillance with potential conditions attached moved a step closer we're already used to seeing our faces reflected black back to us at self-service tills actually i'm not the first thing i do is stick a plastic bag over the camera but from this week some supermarkets will now be scanning your face with age identification ai technology if you wish to buy over 18 products apparently it's going to remove altogether with law flouting youngsters. Just another way of avoiding a difficult conversation and saying no to a child. Of course, it won't stop kids buying booze. They'll just send in an older teen, except there will no longer be someone at the till looking over their shoulder, suspecting that the law might be being broken. Let's not worry about the kids. Let's just outsource that to a computer. And then there's the data harvesting and the mobile phone surveillance that reads your mind, bringing up adverts for products you seem to sometimes merely think about. We've all accepted these intrusions with zero consideration of legal or even just socially agreed, agreed rules around their existence. Privacy has fast emerged as the most significant citizen protection issue in the global information economy.
Of course, every industrial revolution has changed the relationship between the private and the public. Even leaving the home to work in a factory rather than plough your own fields altered that dynamic. Then the arrival of the camera and the printing press triggered similar moral panics about the risks of misinformation or mistaken identity. But now we are literally edging towards a digital tyranny. The traditional definition of privacy was drawn up in 1891 by two American lawyers, and it was the right to be let alone or freedom from interference or intrusion. How quaint. But after World War II, in the year that George Orwell wrote 1984, the UN Declaration of Human Rights stated no one should be subjected to arbitrary interference with his privacy, family, home or correspondence. We were doing quite well until 2016, when the American Patriot Act used the 9-11 disaster as a valid reason, some might say an excuse, to expand the government's legal rights to monitor phone and email communications to keep us all safe, of course. But this fourth industrial revolution that we are in right now, launched as the Great Reset by King Charles, inevitably poses the most serious threats to our anonymity, our privacy and our freedoms. When Labour Home Secretary David Blunkett tried to introduce ID cards to the UK in 2004, Boris Johnson said that it was a loss of liberty and that he would rather physically eat his card than present it for inspection. We were doing quite well. But of course the pandemic changed everything and in September 2020 the government announced that they were pressing ahead with a digital identity scheme so that we could securely prove who we were online to keep us all safe, of course. Also now, though, for your convenience, at a time when nothing works and nothing is convenient. Blunkett is back on the propaganda trail, announcing that a biometric digital ID system which logs your eyeballs or facial features is the only way to solve the small boat crisis. And guess who's in line for the contract? Fujitsu, as they made such a good job of the post office scandal. The small boat's move is very clever. Pick the topic that most incenses people and offer this as a handy solution. It might work. But I can't help thinking that illegal migrants wanting to be British citizens would line up to have their eyeballs scanned and registered as legit. But it will definitely compromise the liberty of us ordinary people who will find all of our data and misdemeanors logged in a central database. Next step, conditions of freedom attached, be that carbon credits, calories consumed or parking fines unpaid. Plus, thanks to last week's Scottish Hate Crime Act, you can now add a fear of being dobbed in by someone sat at your own dinner table to your paranoia list. Make sure Grandad doesn't slip up with his terminology. If he can be deemed to be stirring up hate, his words could be logged even if it isn't deemed a crime. There are now an estimated 5 million CCTV cameras in the UK alone. Are they making your life more convenient? I'd say a hard no. Are you safer because there's a camera on every corner? Well, crime and conviction figures would prove not. So who is it all for? The illusion of safety and convenience is always about hiding the ambition to control. Right, let's speak about this with Peter Aiton, Professor of Decision Research at University of Leeds. He's done a lot of work into the decisions people make regarding their privacy or lack of it. Hello, Peter. Thank you very much uh, for joining me. Um, how would you characterise that our relationship with privacy has changed throughout recent years, at least? Well, the challenges have changed completely. I mean, many things that we used to do... Um, literally in a very private way with very few people knowing about them are now done in a manner which uh, is accessible to all sorts of onlookers and data gatherers. So quite mundane tasks like um, internet searches, uh, dating apps, um, you know, all of these things mm. are, you know, coming in very recent times and we haven't yet really uh, evolved um, procedures to govern uh, not just the regulations, but our own intuitions about mm. what is reasonable to disclose, what should be kept private, in what kind of way is it private, and, and so on. I mean, there's a multitude of issues there. And it very much kind of 
changes as well, I think, our relationship between the individual and the state as well to some degree in that we are just the little people and that actually if we do move towards the digital ID centralised government run system, there's something very much about a paternal relationship that the state takes on under that uh, under those roles, perhaps, and that wouldn't necessarily, in my view, be positive. Well, I mean, the technology is going to be irresistible, of course. I mean, things are going to have to be dealt with in one way or another. Mm. Um, of course, you know, we have, in theory, in a democracy, we have the ability to de develop legislation and regulation to determine exactly uh, how people should operate. Um, you know, I appreciate you can be uh, suspicious about the uh, capacity to, to do these things, but the science about this is, uh, you know, that's what I know anything about, um, suggests that uh, people's understanding of um, what's at stake is very limited and their ability to make the key decisions is also very limited. So privacy and your... Um, you know, rights over your information almost always is going to involve difficult trade-offs of one kind or another. Like if you want to gain access to a service, you're going to have to interact with that service in some way and provide mm. data. What data should you provide? What um, uh, rights the uh, holder of those data have to uh, exploit them in whatever way? These things are becoming very hard to summarize in a simple way for people to make straightforward judgments about. In a way, so there, is a, there is a paradox uh, here because you've never had a time when companies particularly have to be more, caref more careful with our data. We've had the GDPR rules, a lot of it actually coming from, from the EU in terms of what companies can do with our information. But I think from a, a personal point of view, there's a more kind of pernicious effect, which is just this sense that we're being watched. And how do human beings tend to react to the notion of being watched? Is there a negative in the longer term to literally what it is to be human? Well, of course, you know, it can sound rather sinister and menacing, and perhaps, you know, that's something that we really ought to be very concerned about. I mean, there plainly is the potential to um, exploit data in ways that may not be to the benefit of the people providing those data, and we need protection in order to to achieve that. Um, as I say, the science on this, um, to the extent it can inform these arguments, um, really just shows how difficult it is. So, for example, um, you know, there's when you enter into a, some kind of service arrangement, I don't know, with Facebook or whoever, mm. there's all, almost always a privacy agreement, which mm. explains how the provider of the service is going to use your data. And the research shows that most people don't bother to read those privacy agreements at all. Um, you know, I put my hand up there. Mm. But also the research shows that even if they did bother to read them, they wouldn't be able to understand them. So they're, you know, mm. often they're very lengthy uh, documents written in legalistic terminology, which really doesn't leave you any the wiser about what may or may not happen with the information that you provide. And that's not coincidental, is it, Peter? Because the benefits of being able to use our data is very, very profitable for a lot of these corporations. And it's, it's predicated on the idea that we won't opt out of that relationship. Are you also seeing a time where it's impossible to even function in modern society without being embedded in some of this um, tech um, registration systems, let's say? Well, you hear about people, I was listening to um, John Cooper Clark on the radio a few weeks ago, who doesn't even have a mobile phone and has never interacted with the internet in any way. Wow. But uh, you know, that in a way proves the point. I mean, you've got to be pretty eccentric and discrepant with uh, the modern world in order to, you know, resist the incursions completely. Mm. As I say, I mean, yeah. the regulation and the legislation is there to be formulated, but from the scientific perspective, I mean, I worry about this as a sort of uh, challenge to human psychology. Like, what can people understand about what's going on uh, in a manner that enables them to be empowered 
to make decisions and to recognize the the uh, uh, the, 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 the what's at stake and yeah. how to control it. I mean, it's rapidly um, eluding the majority of the electorate, I think, in terms of understanding. Exactly. And that is why we're having this conversation and why, that's why you have been the perfect person to talk to about it as well. Uh, thank you so much, Peter Ayton there, Professor of Decision Research at the University of Leeds. Um, I find it absolutely fascinating, this topic, and I'm going to be talking to somebody from Big Brother Watch, actually, one of the organisations who can explain a little bit of what Peter was saying then about why the law hasn't kept up with how we as the, uh, the British people maybe feel about this kind of surveillance. I'm also going to be talking to a reality star, an online influencer, Frankie Essex. She lives her whole life in the public eye. Does she have any concerns about sense spending so much time in that undeletable public space? You're watching Bev Turner on The Neil Oliver Show on GB News. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office. We hold on to rather unsettled weather across the UK during the week ahead. Further spells of rain in most areas and often quite windy too. Storm Kathleen starting to move away towards the north and uh, northeast of the UK now, but notice low pressure gathering once again towards the southwest, and it's this that will bring further wet and windy weather over the next couple of days. Back to the detail for this evening and overnight, and it's a fairly quiet picture for many areas, at least for a time, because notice there's uh, more wet weather coming in across the southwest of the UK into parts of Wales, and the very blustery showers we've seen recently up towards the northwest will gradually ease into the early hours. Temperatures dipping down to mid single figures towards the north under the clearest spells overnight, but uh, starting to rise tonight as the cloud and rain comes up from the south and southwest. There'll be some bright weather around tomorrow across some of the eastern areas during the morning, but a showery burst of rain already gathering down towards the south and southwest, becoming more widespread across England and Wales into the afternoon, and some of those turning quite heavy. Northern Ireland, after a bright start, will see some rain in the afternoon, so it's Scotland that's set to see the best of the weather, here plenty of sunshine, and feeling pleasant enough in light winds, with temperatures up to about 12 degrees. Tuesday looks like being a very unsettled day across all areas. We have warnings in force for wind and rain, wettest weather, they're likely towards the northeast of the UK, and the windiest conditions generally down towards the south and southwest. But wherever you are, a pretty blustery and wet day to come, and it stays quite unsettled during the week ahead, perhaps a bit warmer and a bit drier come Thursday. But generally speaking, very unsettled. That warm feeling inside from Box Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. Do you mind if I ask you a little bit about Sebastian? Um, I just, it really amazes me how a mother um, who can lose a child in such a shocking and unexpected way, so little, so precious, can then turn that grief into something so positive. How did you find the strength to get up, um, get a camera crew, as you say, travel to the other side of the world and investigate all of this. Um, I was angry at Sebastian for dying. Um, you know, you feel like saying, God, I, yeah, 32 years later and I can still get very, very upset about it. I was angry that something that, that while he while he was born and lived with me and slept and then died, they were actively campaigning in New Zealand to try and stop this happening because they had a very high cot death rate there. Um, they had the, the, the lady, uh, the Anne Diamond, if you like, of uh, New Zealand, a, a television presenter called Judy Bailey, went on telly every night and said, if you're just about to put your baby down to sleep, put him on his or her back, not the tummy, and this will help. And their cot death rate plummeted. And I went out to New Zealand and met her, and it was anger that drove me to come back and demand that we have the same advert here, um, the same campaign. And, of course, I got all this complete nonsense from the Department of Health saying, you know, oh, young mothers do not watch television, I was told. In other words, while New Zealand mums were being told how to save their babies' lives. 
We actively denied British mums that advice wow. during the time that Sebastian and others were dying. And, and the other point I suppose to make is it's helpful to educate all generations because when I think when I had my mm. babies, my mum would say, oh, he's not settling, just stick him on his tummy, he'll be much happier, that's what we did with you. And we had to say, well, things have changed mm. and, you know, yes. but it's about educating everybody because it's not everybody. just the mums Everybody's... that get their hands on the babies. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live with me, Bev Turner, while Neil takes a break. Now, we've been talking this evening about private lives, what it means for you. We've got Scotland's new hate crime law this week and this subject of digital ID cropped up. Uh, Lord Blunkett was telling Keir Starmer that he must introduce biometric digital ID should have become Prime Minister to tackle small boats. Both of these pose threats to our privacy, I would say. But some people live in a world where they broadcast their life to the entire globe. One of those is reality TV star and internet personality Frankie Essex. Here she is on the show. The only way is Essex. I want to move out, but I don't want to, I just don't want to live here no more. Why though? I want to get my, I want a bit more on his face and like, mm. do you know what I mean? Like, but you know I've always been about since I was like 17, yeah, no. 18. Yeah, I know you always talk about it, but it's never happened, does it? You know, but now I'm 21, do you know what I mean? 21, I need to move out. Now, there's a shot, inexplicably Joey Essex with no top on there, but a jacket in the kitchen, <laughs> Frankie. Um, but you, you have little twins now as well. So you've chosen this, this life, this career, this job, which is about broadcasting who you are. Do you have any yeah. conflict about that in, in your own mind? Do you have any regrets or is it ever difficult to live in, in the public spotlight in the way that you do? It's not really. I think it was like obviously it was a big thing going into it because it was the unknown. Like we was all just normal kids really from Essex. Um, but my psychiatrist when I was younger, she said to me the only big thing that will ever change. Obviously, I lost my mum to suicide, so she said the only thing will ever change me being a mum, like the biggest impact. Mm. So it didn't have much of an impact on me myself. But like, obviously, it has other people and whatnot, you know. Um, mm. But yeah, being a mum has definitely changed me, but uh, it was just a bonus to my life, you know, being on the show. And, and obviously, when you did The Only Way is Essex, you were opening up your, your life to scrutiny. Yeah. Did that come with uh, difficulties as well, or has it always been fairly plain sailing for you? No, it, it definitely did with my weight. I must say, uh, the press um, just was on me about my weight. And when I look back, I weren't even that big, mm. um, which was hard for me, um, 100%. And now I look back, I was like, oh my God, I weren't even that big. Like, I've always thought I was bigger than I, what I really was, you know? Yeah. Um, so that definitely was a big impact. Always has been now for me. Um, and then after having the twins, there was um, a pack outside my house and I didn't know he was there. And um, I uh, took the babies for a walk for the first time on my own. So it was like a bit of a proud moment for me. I didn't know he was there until the pictures went out the next day. And I thought, honestly, I didn't see him. And I was really upset because I knew the pack as well. Because you get to know them over the years, mm. you know. They're always there. But I, generally, I've moved house and everything. So I don't know how he found out where I lived. Um, but I was really upset. And I did message him because I had his number and everything. Right. Um, and just said, I think we're bang out of order. Like doing them pictures without me knowing with my newborn babies because I was on my own and I took Logan out of the pram and I was a bit nervous I was on my own do you know what I mean I just thought oh, if he was there I wish he would have said yeah so so in a way even though you do 
curate your life on social media and on Instagram and you've got tons of followers on all of your social media. Yeah. When somebody does it, when it's not on your terms, that still feels mm -hmm. like some sort of privacy violation. Oh my God, definitely. Like before I was even on the show, it was Joey was on the show. Um, someone told a story about our mum and it weren't, it's not someone else's story to sell. Mm. It's our story, not not even to sell, to say, you know. Because Joey had never talked about on the show. No one knew, the press, no one knew what happened with her mm. until someone sold a story to the news of the world or the sun. And it was front page, it was awful. Like my whole family had to go through it kind of again, you know? Yeah. Can you, can you ever imagine a time, Frankie, where you would step out of the public eye completely? Because... I don't think, people say, oh, Instagram is it's such an easy job being an influencer. I think it's my worst nightmare, having to look good all the time, having to have your babies looking cute all the time, when life is probably I'm much more say. chaotic than that. You know, does it no. ever get a bit much? Do you know what? I'm not one of them people who like always look a million dollars. Like, I, I generally don't say, I burnt my hand about an hour ago on the hot tap. Mm. Um, I'm always out, me and the babies go out. We This morning we went out with them um, to the nursery to go and get some plants. I just chucked on there when he's had pajamas on underneath. I just chucked on a tracksuit over the top. Like, I live quite a normal life, do you know what I mean? Um, and your babies are, they're, they're still very little, aren't they, at the moment? But some people might yeah. say, well, you've not, they, they don't have a choice now about whether they are ever going to have yeah. a, a private life. And I imagine you've probably grappled with that a bit. Yeah, but kind of. But I think like with Instagram and the just social media nowadays, you've got a choice whether you want to post them or not on your social media. Mm. I'm not the only one. Thousands, millions of people post their children up, you know, um, celebrity or not celebrity. So it's just a choice me and Luke actually did make before they was even here. Yeah. We actually spoke about it because it, it is one of those things. I think it is something you speak about, you know. OK, well, Frankie, thank you so much for joining us and giving your unique insight uh, into your fascinating life. Frankie Essex there. Um, I think generational issues play a massive part in this. Do you, do that generation, do you think, and younger give up their privacy uh, at their peril? Now, after the break, we're going to be speaking to the founder of that company, Littercam, this technology which can turn ordinary CCTV cameras into ones which can identify somebody littering from a car. Is it a sinister development? Discussing that next. You're watching The Neil Oliver Show on GP News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office. We hold on to rather unsettled weather across the UK during the week ahead. Further spells of rain in most areas and often quite windy too. Storm Kathleen started to move away towards the north and uh, northeast of the UK now, but notice low pressure gathering once again towards the southwest, and it's this that will bring further wet and windy weather over the next couple of days. Back to the detail for this evening and overnight, and it's a fairly quiet picture for many areas, at least for a time, because notice there's uh, more wet weather coming in across the southwest of the UK into parts of Wales, and the very blustery showers we've seen recently up towards the northwest will gradually ease into the early hours. Temperatures dipping down to mid single figures towards the north under the clearest spells overnight, but uh, starting to rise tonight as the cloud and rain comes up from the south and southwest. There'll be some bright weather around tomorrow across some of the eastern areas during the morning. But a showery burst of rain already gathering down towards the south and southwest, becoming more widespread across England and Wales into the afternoon, and some of those turning quite heavy. Northern Ireland, after a bright start, will see some rain in the afternoon, so it's Scotland that's set to see the best of the weather, here plenty of sunshine, and feeling pleasant enough in light winds, with temperatures up to about 12 degrees. Tuesday looks like being a very unsettled day across all areas. We have warnings in force for wind and rain, wettest weather, they're likely towards the northeast of the UK and the windiest conditions generally down towards the south and southwest. But wherever you are, a pretty blustery and wet day to come and it stays quite unsettled during the week ahead, perhaps a bit warmer and a bit drier come Thursday. But generally speaking, very unsettled. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel.
I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made what my I'm argument saying? for me. No, what, okay, oh, what, 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 what what my guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9pm only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live with me, Bev Turner. Now, eight councils around Britain have been trialling a new AI method of combating littering. The technology called LitterCam uses AI to track down litterers using CCTV camera footage, which can spot potential miscreants and track them down by registering the car's number plate. I'm joined now by Andrew Kemp, the founder and CEO of LitterCam. Andrew, thank you so much for joining me. Now, you terrify me with your technology, but also there's one thing I hate more than technology. It's people throwing litter out of car windows. So you also really confuse me about where I sit on this, Andrew. How did it come around in the first place, this technology? Uh, Bev, it's a really, really good question. Um, I guess I was brought up in a family of individuals who really looked after the, uh, the neighborhood and instilled a sense of civic pride. My dad would pick up litter in the street after the Bin Lorry had been past a keen fisherman and he'd come home with other people's bags of litter. Um, I was at a crossroads in terms of career change a number of years ago and saw that the government had issued the litter strategy for England in effectively giving power to local authorities across England to use technology that didn't yet exist. I saw an opportunity and mm. here we are. And have you had to jump through all sorts of legal hoops to spy on people, Andrew? Because that is what you're doing. Uh, I wouldn't say we're spying on people. So our are. customers... Uh, oh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good comment, Bev. Um, so our, our customers are local authorities. The way that technology is being designed, which is software, is to analyse existing CCTV cameras if there are littering hotspots, or if they've got problem litter areas where there's no coverage, we can provide new equipment at those locations. So we're not a CCTV uh, camera supplier per se. Um, if a local authority does wish to install CCTV cameras, there's a specific process that they have to follow. It's uh, part of the home office. It's called the surveillance camera code of practice. So they have to, uh, basically produce a, an impact assessment to do with data privacy so there's there's absolute sort of safeguards in place there but you could i guess catch someone snogging someone in the back of their car that doesn't want to be there and you might out them you will have that footage i'm just using a trite example of what people might do in their cars that they may not want you to be watching what happens to that footage andrew so it's not our footage. So again, it's uh, local authorities that have, have got the footage and um, the software is designed just to detect the action of littering from, from a vehicle. Right. So there may be a, a 10, 20, 30 second clip that spans a littering offence and the, 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 the number plate. Um, so the system doesn't capture uh, footage on, a, on an ongoing basis and store that. And then you collaborate with the DVLA and the owner of that car gets a ticket through the post. Is it proving successful? We're at quite an early stage, really. So the DVLA have only uh, recently opened up their systems to be used for the offence of littering from vehicles. Right. Um, uh, so it's a, a fairly new development. I think also the background of uh, local government finance uh, is, is proving challenging for them. So we've come up with some innovative financial models that enables them to use our technology on a, right. on a 
sort of attractive and accessible places, really. OK, stay where you are. I'm joined by Mark Johnson as well here in the studio, advocacy manager for uh, Big Brother Watch. Listening to that, uh, Mark, um, what are you thinking from your personal expertise point when you see this new phenomenon of litter cam? Well, I, I think the thing that worries me the most is kind of like the mission creep. I mean, when we first introduced CCTV to society, you know, it was done under, under the justification of, you know, trying to uh, find evidence or, or look at very serious crime that was taking place. And I think this will unnerve people because it's the kind of level of intrusion into their lives to such a, you know, low level degree um, that you could reasonably say, is the surveillance warranted? Is it justified? Is it proportionate? Which is a really mm -hmm. crucial question we should always apply to these kind of scenarios. And I think people will find it slightly creepy and invasive, you know, with all due mm -hmm. respect to Andrew. Andrew, do you have to have signs up saying, we are watching you, don't empty your ashtray out of your window? <laughs> um, maybe those words could be chosen by a local authority. Um, Might work. <laughs> so local authority so this going back to the surveillance camera code of practice they talk about having signage also the defra code of practice as well talks about uh, publication campaigns so it that can be interpreted by them as signage it could be detail on their website they might have social media posts so it it shouldn't be viewed as a as a as a way of sneakily um, trying to catch out the public for people who choose to litter. I mean, it definitely is sneakily trying to catch out the public if they try to litter. Do you have similar concerns, Mark, that, that we would have about a creeping surveillance state? I'm guessing probably not. I mean, like I say, on yours, I'm quite torn because I hate littering. So I am, I am a little bit conflicted about it. But I think the mission creep that Mark talked about is real. Sorry, Bev, is that a question to me? Yes, yeah, sorry. Carry on, Andrew. Yeah. I was saying, do you have um, any, do you have similar concerns about the way that technology, and particularly surveillance, is intruding in all of our lives in all sorts of ways? Um, so surveillance could be viewed as intruding into, into people's lives, but I think also they, they would have a, a, a responsibility to, to put sort of safeguards in place. If you take a, a parent as an, as an example, mm. they're probably educated children on the, on the safe use of technology um, and what to post online. It's just been featured on your show earlier on this afternoon in terms of um, mem members of parliament exchanging information that they shouldn't have done. Yeah, um, very timely. Uh, absolutely. So I think the same arguments apply, really. Mark, um, it's interesting that the idea that we as parents might educate our kids about what they share online, I think those are two very different issues. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I, I mean, I think that's slightly separate. I mean, just to pick up on a point that um, Andrew made about this, you know, I, I think one of my big concerns here um, is the, the kind of extent to which we are now surveilling uh, the population here in the UK. There is nothing necessarily wrong with surveillance where it is targeted, it is proportionate, where there's something, somebody that you suspect has done some wrongdoing and you target the surveillance at them. But what I'm worried about, and I think people generally are concerned about, is this idea that the surveillance should be population wide. It's not targeted. You know, we're just looking at innocent people just in case they might do something wrong. But mm. it is not specific to looking at criminals. It's actually just population wide. Andrew spoke about the surveillance camera code. Um, that is entirely voluntary. So um, people who operate surveillance cameras can abide by it. They should abide by it. But actually, there's nothing legally binding that makes them um, abide really? by it. Nothing yeah. legally binding? No. Um, obviously, those who operate CCTV cameras will have kind of data protection obligations. But when it comes to the surveillance camera code, it's a voluntary code. And what's really interesting, I think, is there is something of an explosion of surveillance in this country, of CCTV and other forms of surveillance. You know, we did a large piece of work looking at the extent to which there are Chinese state companies operating surveillance systems in the UK, like Hike mm -hmm. Vision, Dower. This is a massively underregulated space, and all we're seeing is more and more cameras and more more and more people being watched. Andrew, so Mark would say there that really you should only be watching people if you know they're under suspicion for something already. Um, I'm guessing that you might say, well, that's why the cameras are in specific litter hotspots. Is that right? Is that how you get around that? In, in part. So um, we can analyze the streams from existing local, local authority CCTV, CCTV estates. So there's no additional equipment there. So there would be no, no further intrusion um, or proliferation of, of technology. But absolutely, as, as, as you heard, 
if there are littering hotspots, we can put equipment in those locations um, to uh, get the action of littering from vehicles. Mm. If, if the problem then subsides, the local authority can relocate that, that equipment or, or, or use the equipment for other, mm. other reasons. It's, it's for the same, the same type of purpose and approach that they um, target and approach fly tipping. Okay, interesting. All right, thank you so much, Andrew Kemp there, the founder and CEO of uh, Litter Camp and Mark Johnson, advocacy manager for Big Brother. Watch, I think you're going to stay with me, aren't you, Mark? Okay, brilliant. Right, next on the show, in Germany, they have relaxed the laws on personal usage of cannabis this week. Is that something we should consider? Over here, we're going to be debating that next. You're with Neil, with Beth Turner. I'm not Neil Oliver, he's normally here. This is GB News. Breakfast, every day from 6am. I don't think you can go and watch a Shakespeare play unless you already know it. It's yes. almost like you have to understand the story, the story. and the characters, yeah. and perhaps have even done a bit of reading into it. Because if you went completely blind, especially in today's world where we don't speak in that kind of way, um, it is, I think, probably a bit alienating. But don't, don't want to say it is alienating at the moment because of the lack of uh, representation. You know what, the actual phrasing they use, right, OK. The disproportionate representation um, propagated white able bodies heterosexual cisgender male narratives I'm sure there's people sitting in a room going what's the most ridiculous thing we can come up with today yes. but I really just chuck all these words and it's cisgender and it's just insane mm. of course Shakespeare was what it was back in the day and that's why it is it's mostly blokes and they're mostly white and lots of speculation that he was actually gay isn't there because he never really saw Anne Hathaway very often and stayed away a lot of the time. I don't know, he, maybe he was a big He might have gay been transgender icon. for all I, I know. know. I mean, I, I don't... <laughs> Begins, I'm looking at you. No, I think you're right. I mean, you know, I think uh, that goes for the profession, too. Mm. Mm. Uh, I mean, it, it's... Uh, I, I, I do think we... I mean, I remember seeing Macbeth in London with Judi Dench and Ian McKellen, and it was one of the most exciting wow. evenings ever. And it was a cold night at the Donmar Theatre, outside and inside, and it, that gave it atmosphere. There are certain things that you go along and see something else, and you think, I'll walk out in the interval. Yeah. Macbeth is, is a so sexy bad. play, though. Let's talk about, um, oh, there's so many. Can I live to be 100? Oh, um, this is depressing. I think it is depressing. Oh. I like to stay here and now. I don't want to live to 100. Oh, don't and say I'm that. right behind you. I don't you. even want to. My father died at 63. That'll be me gone this year. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Neil Oliver, live with me, Bev Turner, this evening. So, new laws in Germany came into force this week which legalised a personal possession of cannabis. Since the 1st of April, adults are allowed to carry up to 25 grams of dried cannabis on them and cultivate up to three marijuana plants at home. So, should Britain follow suit? To discuss that, I'm joined by Professor Mike Barnes, a consultant neurologist and Mail on Sunday columnist uh, Peter Hitchens. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you so much uh, for joining me. Peter, let me start with you here in the studio. Uh, this is Germany seeing sense maybe over something which is effectively decriminalised most places anyway now. Well, it isn't everywhere and I don't see why it's sense. Uh, if this were uh, if this were Germany saying, right, let's abandon all attempts of the past 70 years to get rid of cigarettes and tobacco, everyone would think they were mad. 
Uh, sim similarly, a, a country which now proposes to legalize a drug which is increasingly correlated uh, with severe incurable mental illness and to some extent also increasingly correlated with violent crime doesn't seem to me to be sense at all. It seems to me to be sheer craziness. The arguments for it are extraordinarily weak and the, the, the alleged good that it will do, we know from practical experience it will not do. The advocates of this sort of legalization always claim that it will in some way enable them to c control the market, to regulate, uh, to decide the levels of dose and to make huge amounts of money out of tax. Mm. But several jurisdictions have already tried this. Uh, Colorado and California, notably in the United States, and the whole of Canada. And the result has been that the illegal market has continued to flourish alongside the legal one. I think the latest figures show 33%. Right. Uh, this is government, Canadian government figures. 33% mm. of the trade is still in illicit hands, uh, which is, of course, completely unregulated and untaxed and therefore also sells at lower prices. It's a nonsense. And people really are going to have to learn quite soon that if we go down this road, once you've legalised a drug, Mm. And once it then goes into mass use, it's almost impossible to undo the mistake. Professor Mike Barnes, then, what might Germany's logic be to taking this action over cannabis? Well, I think the, the, the logic is, is overwhelming, really, and, and Peter will not be surprised to know that I fundamentally disagree with him. Um, First of all, you can uh, make the, the, the cannabis safer, safer than it is at the moment. Uh, you you will get rid of impurities to start with. You'll make sure that it's a safe drug to take in safe places. Uh, you will reduce uh, the amount of uh, mental illness as associated with it, and there is some. I don't disagree with that at all. Uh, but you'll be able to control that by controlling the level of THC. Uh, and, the, and the risk of mental illness, I have to say, is very small indeed. If we look at the a study in the UK called Drug Science, it's been looking at now nearly 5,000 people with medically prescribed cannabis, uh, there has been not one case, not one case of, of psycho psychopathy in those people. The recent study that showed you have to stop 10,000 men and 29,000 women from smoking cannabis to prevent one episode of psychosis. So yes, it's a risk, but with proper control, it's a very, very small risk. And I have to fundamentally with Peter to say that it does not cause um, violence. There's absolutely no evidence of that whatsoever. Uh, Peter, it's a very convincing um, case that Mike Barnes puts forward there. Um, but we know we've got a mental health epidemic, particularly in this country with teens at the moment. Does anybody really know how much of that has been exacerbated by social cannabis use? Well, nobody knows because the research isn't done. Uh, it's not done by the state. It's not done by the universities. There's, there's nobody in this country with any interest in doing research. All the big money is on the side of legalization. There's enormous amounts of money to be made uh, in the legalization of this drug. And a huge campaign is underway at the moment also internationally to, to get rid of the, the treaties, the United Nations treaties dating back to the 1930s, which actually make it illegal in the first place. And once they can do that, then the, the, then the whole of the United States, for instance, and this country, which, is, which are members of the United Nations Security Council, uh, could actually legalize openly. But they, they, they can't do it at the moment. And the reason for this relentless campaign is because of the billions that can be made out of it. This is the next big tobacco. And I, I have to challenge some things which, which, which Mike Barnes has just said, uh, the evidence uh, of, of, the, uh, of the dangers of marijuana, first of all, comes from the, the, the fact that it's used very widely, particularly in schools at the moment. I'm, I know of one case, and I, I direct everybody who's complacent about this to the extraordinary book by, by, by Patrick. Uh, by, by Patrick Coburn and his son Henry, called Henry's Demons. Henry attended a very nice Canterbury Grammar School in the Garden of England in Kent, and at the age of 11 was introduced to marijuana, and very regrettably, he became severely mentally ill as a result. And I don't think there's really very much question in anybody's mind who was involved. Well, 11 well, is young. It, well, it is young, you're right, but that is where an awful lot of the current market is in, in, in schools at the ages as low as 11. The other thing is what is generally true about legalization or decriminalization, decriminalization of the drug is it doesn't hugely increase the number of people who take it. But what it does do is it increases the number of people who take it regularly and the amount that they take. 
And I think there's a lot of complacency about this. I did some research a few years ago for my book on the subject about the, the complacent rubbish which was emitted by big tobacco, about the, the, the dangers of lung cancer from that in the 1950s and early, and early 60s. And the same sort of bilge, I'm afraid, was talked about how there's really nothing to worry about. On the issue of violence, what I will say is that, the, again, there's no study. I've, I've often tried to get the police to tell me about the, whether there's any evidence of drug use of violent criminals, and they won't even talk about mm. it because the police themselves have given up enforcing the law. There is one very closely studied subset of violent crime, that is mass killings, either by t uh, terrorists in Europe or school shootings in the United States, almost invariably. The culprit is a long-term user of marijuana. Mike, just respond to that, please. Mike Barnes. Yeah, well, you know, I think, Pete, unfortunately, um, it collapses together the people with already existing mental illness who go around you with mass killings and such like. One can't doubt that. And they happen to have cannabis. There's no direct link. There is no, full stop, direct link between cannabis and violence. I'm not going to say people who are violent or mentally ill don't take cannabis. Of course, some do. Some drink alcohol. Some take cornflakes in the morning. But there's not a direct link between cannabis and violence. I have to also, I should say, no, can I say I have to treat I have to treat Mike Barnes as a serious person. When he says nobody nobody gets uh, nobody gets mental illness or or indulges in violent no, no, crime I'm... as a result of eating cornflakes, he's not being a serious person. We know perfectly well. You know perfectly well. You're well well equipped to, to know it that that marijuana is a major psychotropic drug with huge effects on the human brain, and cornflakes are not. It's a silly thing to say. And it demeans you to say it. You also know perfectly well that the reason why there's so little evidence is because there's so little study. And I, as I said just now and made it perfectly clear, there is so little study because who has any in interest in there being such a study? There is a huge industry hoping to make enormous amounts of money. The last thing it needs is lots of definitive studies linking marijuana with, with lifelong incurable mental illness and other studies linking it with violent crime. Go to the website Attacker Smoke Cannabis and see just how many crimes are reported in the local newspapers of this country week after week after week in which the violent person is a long-term user of marijuana and tell go me there's no connection. Go on, Mike. Respond to Peter. Yeah. I'm really sorry to, to break the point. There is no direct connection between cannabis and violence. I'm not saying people who are violent have not taken cannabis. I'm not saying cannabis. I'm not complacent about it at all. There is mental health issues with long-term cannabis use, but properly controlled, that risk is small. It's very small. And honestly, I don't know of any industry that's run better by criminals. Why, if, if there is those issues there, and there are those issues there, I think they're overinflated, but there are those issues there. For heaven's sake, let's run it properly. Let's regulate it properly. Uh, if there's a tax income to be had, let the government have that tax income rather than the criminal fraternity. If there's jobs to be had, as about 100,000 jobs in the UK, let the proper economic market have those jobs rather than the criminal fraternity. So I think, yes, there are risks to it. I'm not being complacent at all, uh, but those risks are minimal, and I think it's better to control and contain those risks by making it legal. And One therefore, would... people use it for what, Mike? And what would people use cannabis for then, even if it was legalised? Well, I, 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 I do want to make quickly, if I may, is actually, it may surprise people that I'm not in favour of immediate legalisation of cannabis because we've got to get the medical market right first. And I was a helpful part of getting the, the medical law changed back in 2018. And now there's 37,000 people prescribed medical cannabis with a great deal of benefit for chronic pain, chronic anxiety, and of course the young children with epilepsy. But we haven't got that right yet. There's about 1.8 million medical users of cannabis in this country, and we've got 37,000 prescribed. So we've got a long way to go before we get the medical side right. Mm. And that's what I want to do before we get the, the uh, legal market. So, Peter, would you be in favour of getting the medical market for cannabis in, a, in better shape and more readily available? I think it's wholly irrelevant. Uh, it may be that marijuana uh, can be used as a medicine. I think the, the jury is ultimately out on it. I know some, the Home Office has, right. been, the home office has been very good about, about letting experiments take place. And indeed, as the, 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 there are a couple of, of THC-based medicines available under certain strict prescription in, in this country. Whether they work or not, I don't know. I do know that the principal uh, campaigner for, for cannabis legalization in the United States, Keith Stroop of Normal, said in 1979, we will use medical marijuana as a red herring 
to give pot a good name. And I think that's fundamentally what the medical marijuana, uh, the medical marijuana issue is about. We should stick to the issue of whether it should be legalized for recreational use, which is what is really a question, in question here. And when Mike Barnes says, why not let the government get taxes, why not put it in the hands of business? Uh, what legalized marijuana means is big marijuana. It means a lot more of it. It means advertising. Uh, mm. The Proposition 64, which was the, the, the model for marijuana legalization in California and the United States, was specific about demanding the freedom to advertise. Remember how many years it took uh, to, to, to prevent big tobacco from advertising in this country. What you're basically proposing is the creation of a new big tobacco uh, with a very, very dangerous drug on widespread sale by big organizations, with the government becoming committed to its continued sale because mm. of its tax revenue. Uh, basically, a, a deeply immoral plan because of the huge known dangers of this drug and other dangers which will certainly become known mm. if you are successful. OK, well, thank you, gentlemen. Mike Barnes, who's giving pot a good name, as Peter said, and trying very hard with the medicinal community at the very least, and Peter mm -hmm. Hitchens, who clearly very much disagrees. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, right, apparently that's it for the TV portion of the show. It's a bit different this one, isn't it? Stay tuned for Free Speech Nation. But I will be carrying on on GBNews.com. We're going to be having a debate on digital ID cards. And I'm going to be talking to a mother who's been taken to court because she did not want her son with complex medical conditions to receive the COVID vaccine. Neil, we'll be back with you next week. Bye for now. Twenty twenty four, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In twenty twenty four. You can win our biggest prize giveaway so far. First, there's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel Gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interests of our country. You made what my I argument say? for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing up and down the country that was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Thank you.
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good evening, the top stories from the GB newsroom. Thousands of Israelis are currently gathering in Jerusalem, calling for the release of hostages still being held by Hamas. It comes as today marks six months since the terror attack on the 7th of October. Families of hostages also joined a rally in London to call for their release, saying the six months after the attack have been hell. Well, also marking the occasion, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has said the government continues to stand by Israel's right to defend its security and added the UK is shocked by the bloodshed and he called for an immediate humanitarian pause in fighting. He also urged Hamas to release its hostages and implored Israel to get aid into Gaza more swiftly. Meanwhile, the Foreign Secretary has used the occasion to stress that the UK's support for Israel is not unconditional. Writing in the Sunday Times, Lord Cameron says there's no doubt where the blame lies over the death of three British aid workers.